Hello and welcome everyone. My name is Dane Menke. I am the Digital Marketing Manager here at Genesis and Land Science. Before we get started, I have just a few administrative items to cover. Since we're trying to keep this under an hour, today's presentation will be conducted with the audience audio settings on mute. This will minimize unwanted background noise from the large number of participants joining us today. If the webinar or audio quality degrades, please try refreshing your browser. If that does not fix the issue, please disconnect and repeat the original login steps to rejoin the webcast. If you have a question, we encourage you to ask it using the question feature located on the webinar panel. We'll collect your questions and do our best to answer them at the end of the presentation. If we don't address your question within the time permitting, we'll make an effort to follow up with you after the webinar. We are recording this webinar and a link to the recording will be emailed to you once it is available. In order to continue to sponsor events that are of value and worthy of your time, we will be sending out a brief survey following the webinar to get your feedback. Today's presentation will discuss coupled aquifer restoration and water reuse and the application of sustainable remediation solutions. With that, I'd like to introduce our presenters for today. We are pleased to have with us today Avram Frankel, Managing Principal at Integral Consulting. Avram Frankel is a professional engineer, technical expert, and program manager with more than 30 years of experience on a wide range of commercial, industrial, municipal, state, and federal sites regulated under numerous state and federal programs. A civil and environmental engineer licensed in California, Oregon, Washington, Colorado, Georgia, and Hawaii, Mr. Frankel provides his clients with strategic risk management and technical analysis in support of due diligence, redevelopment, technology evaluation, site investigation, water treatment, remediation, and legal and litigation matters. We're also pleased to have with us today Gareth Leonard, Managing Director for Regenesis in Europe. Gareth Leonard manages a dedicated team of in-situ remediation specialists to provide the design and implementation of remedial solutions for environmental consultants, remediation contractors, and end users. He has worked in the remediation industry for over 25 years, having provided successful remediation designs and implementation for over a thousand projects across Europe, the Middle East, and Africa. All right, that concludes our introduction. So now I will hand things over to Avram Frankel to get us started. Thank you. I just want to thank Regenesis for inviting me to speak about this topic today. And I'm honored to be presenting with Gareth and look forward to hearing his talk as well. I'm um, talking about coupled aquifer restoration and reuse, which is an old topic actually in our industry, but it's still very relevant. And I'm hoping to sort of re-engage folks in this discussion. So why consider this topic at all? Well, a number of reasons. You know, in some parts of the United States and certainly the world, water supply is often limited. Parts of the world, demand is increasing. Climate change is affecting things in different ways. In some cases, it's increasing supply. In other cases, it's decreasing supply. So there's a lot of uncertainty around water supply. There's many opportunities for reuse. I'm going to talk about that a little later in the presentation with current projects. And I'm really just trying to restart an old conversation and get more input and collaboration with other remediation and water supply professionals. Now, the reality is, is the ultimate fate of treated water not only affects future projects that we may engage in in the remediation industry, but it may change existing ones. I was just talking to a colleague this week in Fort Collins, Colorado, about a large extraction treatment system in Southern California where the end use is now changing because of regulatory considerations. The water is going to go into the aquifer now instead of just being put into a, a surface water. And I think also, not only affecting our industry, it's just an interesting topic for many of us that have been doing this a while. So. Let's just talk about, sometimes this isn't that popular of a discussion, but it's one that I like to engage in, which is when we talk about groundwater remediation at sites, scale becomes very important. And sometimes we forget that there is a wide range of scale in our projects, all the way from small projects, say at a, a gas station or a small commercial facility, you know, all the way up to mega plumes, which can be many miles long. And what's my point here is that there's a point where not all technologies are applicable. So there's an optimal range for the application of, we have so many great in-situ technologies. I mean, I can think back when I started this industry, we had basically none. <laughs> and now we have so many options for source zone treatment, but there is a range there. 
and I personally have been involved in large-scale in situ remediation projects that probably were pushing the limits of the scale where the application was efficient or economically viable. And I think even in some cases, some of the projects I've worked on in the past, if we really did a life cycle analysis today, we may not have picked that option. But then at smaller scales and medium scales, in situ technologies are, you know, as we all know, incredibly applicable and do pencil out very well. As we get into the larger projects where extraction and treatment of groundwater really becomes one of the only options. We go through a range where we have combined remedies, so application of in situ and range of technologies and source zones coupled with extraction and treatment. And then when we get to the mega plumes, and I'm talking sites with plumes two, three, four, even five miles long, I know many of you out there have worked on these kind of projects and know how challenging they are. We really get to a point where extraction and treatment is increasingly the only option. And that's kind of more what I'm going to be talking about a little bit today. The upper end of the combined remedy scale and the areas where extraction treatment really is the only option. So just looking at another way is we have nice little cartoons here that some of my pals here at Integral put together. But we do have sort of the gas station level, you know, relevant topic today with PFAS, you know, AFFF releases at fire training areas, some kind of a plume with multiple sources in the city environment. You know, as the increasing magnitude of impact of a plume, just generally speaking, increases, there's a correlating increase in opportunity for reuse of water that is extracted. And that's, I think I'm speaking quite generally here today, but it turns out to be true. So let's talk about groundwater for a minute. Let's just zoom out for a minute and think about, you know, globally what's going on with groundwater. And I do want to give credit to National Groundwater Association because most of this information, it's available on their website. But anyway, globally, groundwater provides almost half of all drinking water worldwide. About 70% of groundwater withdrawn worldwide is used for agriculture, which may not be surprising to folks and may be surprising to others. How much of the world's groundwater is contaminated is an open question. But I think we can assume that, that it's expanding due to occurrence, releases, regulation, and then increased detection. I think we're seeing that with PFAS right now, but we've seen it in the past with many other emerging contaminants. So, and also just think of all the places in the world where groundwater is not regulated, but could be regulated in the future. So I think what we consider to be contaminated aquifers and contaminated groundwater is only going to increase. If we talk about the U.S. just for a second here, groundwater is a significant water supply source. And what's interesting is the amount of groundwater storage really dwarfs our present surface water supply, and that's really not going to change. About 90% of our freshwater supplies lie underground, but less than 30% of the water we use comes from underground sources. So it's not hard to posit out there that we're probably going to use more groundwater. And in fact, use has been gradually increased. Around 40% of the U.S. population depends on groundwater for drinking water supply. Again, similar to globally, irrigation accounts for the largest use of groundwater in the United States currently. So you know, what am I talking about? You know, what types of systems are we actually talking about and, and why are they relevant? Let me just run through some remediation applications. One would be extraction of groundwater, treatment, and then direct distribution into a water supplier or direct distribution for agricultural use. This is nothing new about this. This has been happening for a while, for decades, actually. Then there's the situation of extraction, treatment, and then reinjection into an aquifer or reinfiltration through spreading basins or other means. And then we have combined remedies where those things are going on, but there's also source zone remediation by other technologies, as I've mentioned before. So all these different things are going on. And I would add, I think infiltration is something that we're going to see more of. Then there's sort of, that, that's coming from a remediation perspective an aquifer restoration perspective, but there's a whole nother world here of production wells being used as extraction wells, where the entry point for reuse is through drinking water systems. And these are drinking water supply applications where a well field used for a water supplier ends up by one means or another becoming essentially a remediation system. And that's happened. We have NPL sites where an operable unit, the remedy is actually an existing drinking water well field. 
We have also the situation where treatment is added to existing drinking water systems. And that is something that people don't really talk about a whole lot in the remediation industry. But I can say from my years of working in the one two trichloropropane litigation world in California, there are literally hundreds of systems where granular activated carbon is being added to, which means that those production wells are now having treatment for one to three TCP and essentially aquifer restoration indirectly is occurring. We've seen that with PFAS. We've seen it in the past with other soil fumigants. We've seen it with CVOCs for years, but we don't really talk about it that much. And then we have the situation with managed aquifer recharge and aquifer storage and recovery wells, some of which I'm showing here, which is really a perspective from the water supply side. And what I'm really hoping to talk about here is how we can water supply and remediation discussions can come together. We also have this situation of indirect potable reuse, like what Orange County Water District has, where wastewater is being treated and then re-infiltrated into an aquifer that's ultimately used for drinking water. So I think program integration is part of the future, and I'm really interested in other people's perspectives on this. So we kind of, as part of preparing to have this little chat today, we did a little experiment, a little research project over here at Integral. And we're like, well, how, what kind of a data set could we use to sort of, you know, look into this a little bit more, at least preliminarily. So we decided after poking around a bit to look at all the national priority list sites under CERCLA in the United States. And that's a pretty big data set of remediation program, almost 2,000 actually, if you include planned remedies, remedies implemented, and actually sites where remedies have been completed. And I want to thank, uh, we have a great intern program this year at Integral, which if anybody out there is interested in applying for that next summer, we'd, we'd love to hear from you. But we have this wonderful intern, Hannah McCollum, who helped me out with this. And we did a web scraping and data analytics exercise. And let me just walk you through what we came up with here. So this is all the NPL sites in the US. These are the NPL sites where there's groundwater extraction as part of the remedy. This is now looking at, of those sites, how many have any form of reuse? So that could be for drinking water application, for agricultural or irrigation, or reinjection back into an aquifer. And you'll see we're getting fewer and fewer little dots on the map here. And it's kind of interesting to look at where the concentrations are of these dots. And by the way, I just want to say there's some NPL sites in, in Europe, DOD sites, and there's a couple down in Puerto Rico, which we're not showing. So of those reuse sites, here's the number that are drinking water reuse. So the data set's getting smaller here. And here's agriculture. So it is interesting that there are agricultural applications and reuse coming out of NPL projects, but again, relatively few. And then here's the sites that have some form of groundwater reinjection. Again, kind of interesting concentration in the Northeast, but overall relatively few sites. And this is just a, looking at the different kinds of reuse by category, and you kind of see the spread here, just adding it all up, integrating it for folks to see together, and then kind of zooming all the way back out. Here's all the sites. Here's where we had groundwater extraction. Here's where there's potable reuse, irrigation, agricultural reuse, and aquifer reinjection. And I'm happy to share these slides with anybody. And the result of our little research, just reach out to me. I'd be happy to do that. So the, kind of just summing it all up, what did this really come down? So there's almost 1,900 NPL sites. 337 have some form of groundwater extraction, which is 18% of the total. Of all of those, so 67 have some form of groundwater reuse. So 4% of the total or 20% of the sites with extraction. And then of those 67 sites, there's 28 drinking water applications, 38 reinjection applications, and nine agricultural. Some of you sharp folks out there realize that those three blue numbers equal 75 and not 67. And that's because there's eight sites actually where there's multiple use some combo of drinking, agricultural reinjection. So I think the punchline here, and we kind of want to dig into this more uh, moving forward, and we may publish a paper on this, is sort of why is all this happening? Let's talk about that a little bit. And let's, let's also talk about that that's just NPL sites. There is reuse happening on state regulated sites, and there's reuse happening in other contexts. So let me just give you some examples. 
the Central Trucking Meadows Remediation District. This is an airstripper tower on the left, right off their website, publicly available. This is a long-standing state regulated project in Nevada in the Reno area, where there's just been an integration of production wells, as I was mentioning before, for use as capture wells with treatment. And it's a long-standing, very successful project. It has nothing to do with NPL sites. There's Reese Center, which I was fortunate enough to be the program manager on for five years when I was at Arcadis, and many very talented people at Arcadis were involved in this project, which was the remediation of a you know, three to four mile plume from the old Reese Air Force Base as part of a big redevelopment project, Reese Center project. You can, you can Google it and check it out. It's really kind of a great story. But this plume was remediated by, is a combined remedy situation, groundwater extraction, then very creative reinjection, and also we did in situ bioremediation in source areas. But really the remediation was much was heavily driven by groundwater extraction and reinjection, and the aquifer was used for irrigation purposes. That's also a storage site, and there's much more to talk about on that one. But I just want to mention it because it was a RICRA site, not an NPL site, and it did achieve closure under RICRA. This upper right is the Kennecott mine. Many of you are probably very familiar with it in Salt Lake City area. It's a very interesting, also long-standing natural resource damage settlement that included includes it's an operating system extraction, treatment, and distribution of water from the mine to a regional utility for drinking water. Also, long-standing, very interesting project regulated by the state of Utah. And I just want to mention a couple other ones, because this one's been in the news. Stewart, Florida, which if you've been following all the PFAS news, was the bellwether case for the multi-district litigation, which is now subject to a large settlement. Anyway, many of us were involved in evaluating the Stewart site, but it's a long-standing, a couple dozen production wells where Florida has incorporated a couple different VOC remedies and also PFAS. Now PFAS is being extracted. The primary remediation mechanism there is the production wells. So, and I'll wrap it up here pretty quickly. So thinking about, we have many existing systems. We have systems that are being built. We have all kinds of groundwater extraction, combined remedy systems that may or may not be considering reuse. But if we were to consider reuse on these projects, and some of us are probably doing that right now, here are some technical considerations. And I want to thank my colleague, Jeff Davis in Salt Lake City. He's done a lot of reinjection and reuse work and uh, was helpful in highlighting some of these considerations. So one is geochemistry. I think this isn't news to a lot of practitioners in the field, but when you're pulling water out, treating it, maybe blending it, and then reinjecting it, there can be significant geochemistry considerations. We've certainly seen that on large scale in situ remediation projects, but it happens in this context as well with extraction and reinjection or extraction and reinfiltration. So we have to be very careful about managing geochemical considerations so that we don't create some kind of disillusion of, say, metals out of the aquifer matrix and create a plume. There's a situation with emerging contaminants, and I can say I've got the battle scars from this one where there's extraction and reinjection, and what's being reinjected includes chemicals that are not regulated, but then later get regulated. And this happened with sulfalane, it has happened with PFAS, it's, ha it's happened with a lot of emerging contaminants, hexavalent chromium, perchlorate, where essentially plumes were expanded or created unintentionally. And I think that's a tough one, but we have so many lessons learned on this that I think we should be able to get out ahead of this in future projects. There's the issue of disinfection byproducts. In some cases, states are requiring disinfection prior to reinjection, even though it actually technically might not make sense to do that. It might not be necessary. It's required. So that needs to be managed so that we don't create a disinfection byproduct. And injection well design, I know those of you out there that have done it, do it, know how in some cases injection is easy. In some cases, it's very difficult. So just something to watch out for. That is almost an art in, in how to effectively design injection wells and injection well network. And then the consideration of the effects of other wells, production wells or domestic wells or other wells that may affect your project. And this is, uh, I want to talk about this a little bit more from an administrative standpoint. 
So permitting is a really big issue with these projects, and I know many of you know this and have lived it. And I want to also thank my colleague at Integral, James Lesperance. He's recently come back to us from working in industry and he was in the thick of this on a project down in Southern California. But in most states, we have environmental regulation, water supply regulation, and water rights regulation, and typically by three different agencies. Not always, but typically. So are these agencies talking to each other? Are they aligned? incentive-wise, politically, are there mechanisms for everybody to talk together? There are cases where there is great alignment and a project moves forward fairly smooth. There are cases where there is not good alignment and the interests of these agencies are not aligned and it puts the onus on us as consultants and with our clients to work through that process. So why are there issues? Well, there's control issues. There's pushback in some jurisdictions to using production wells at all as extraction wells. In other jurisdictions, like the one I mentioned in Reno, there's no pushback. So that's just the reality of the situation. The really core issue there is that environmental regulators want to have control of all of the infrastructure on a remediation project, but that might not be possible when there's production wells in the vicinity. So ideally, production wells can become part of the solution, but if they're not, they still need to be considered in terms of the design of the in some cases with water rights, simply putting the water back in the aquifer solves that problem. In other cases, it doesn't. There's the issue of ghost wells in permitting and underlying modeling. So there's almost always a hydraulic model to support these projects. And just the effects of all of these other wells really need to be accounted for to have a successful design. So there's different wells and there's different priorities, but we have many examples. I mean, just look at the NPL sites I showed. Look at the other examples. Uh, many of you probably have some examples of where these worlds can come together, where the priorities can align and projects can move forward and we can have more groundwater reuse. Quickly, and I'll wrap it up here, some other factors that may change and affect these kind of projects. Natural resource damage settlements. We've seen many of them. This was a big one in Minnesota and had, had a role in that. Where money is maybe set aside as part of settlement, as we saw in Salt Lake City, for projects that it can involve groundwater reuse. I think as we move forward in the PFAS world, UCMR5 monitoring will occur. I don't think it's going on a limb saying that we might detect more PFAS as regulation becomes more uniform, plumes are going to get bigger. I don't think it's a huge stretch to say that more production wells may be affected or that. There may be more intersection of PFAS occurrence with remediation projects. There's sustainability considerations, there's political considerations, there's environment, social, and corporate governance factors where industry, in some cases, is becoming much more incentivized to do more sustainable activities, and that we're seeing that play out with remediation projects. And then there's environmental justice. Personally, I haven't seen that be a factor in these kind of projects in terms of reuse, but it could be down the road. So just something to look out for. And that's all I've got. I'm happy to discuss this with anybody and I'm really just trying to promote a broader discussion on this stuff. So thank you. Thanks, Avram, that was really interesting. You touched on a few things that I'm going to talk about, emerging contaminants. You mentioned life cycle analysis of remediation projects. Um, so. I'm talking about something that's aligned with what you just touched on, particularly with the value of groundwater. Initially, this started as a study into sustainability. And as we went through this further, we sort of realized the importance of what we were doing. So I'll get into it and see where we go. So I'm talking today about sustainable PFAS remediation comparing the environmental impact of enhanced attenuation using colloidal activated carbon to pump and treat the system. It's a nice snappy title there. So I'm talking about per and polyfluoral alkyl substances. So PFAS, uh, a topic that we're never far away from, it seems these days, everybody's talking about them. I wanna just talk about how the different attributes of these products make them particularly problematic for us. So for one, they are widely used. They're incredibly useful because they are omniphobic. 
Uh, and so you can use them for all sorts of coatings, waterproofings, oil proofings, all sorts of things. So, so they're used everywhere. We're then using them for foam, for firefighting, so aqueous film forming foams. So there's not many other contaminants that we actively pump onto the ground on a regular basis, but we're doing that with PFAS and or we have been doing that with PFAS for, for many, many years. So we, we're taking this contaminant and putting it straight onto the surface where it can infiltrate into the ground. And then once it's in the ground, there's a number of challenging behaviors that it has. One is that it's retained in the soils for decades, often in the upper part of the, the Vedo zone where you'll get a reservoir of this contamination that'll just then leach into the groundwater for decades and decades and decades. Once it then does start to discharge into the groundwater, it's really mobile. So these big plumes, that were mentioned in the previous talk can be created by PFAS. And that's exacerbated by the fact that it's recalcitrant to degradation. At the moment, we, we don't think that it can be biologically degraded. Uh, it's not chemically degraded. So these plumes get very large. PFAS is toxic at low concentrations, certainly the, the longer chain PFAS are. So what it means is we, we've got very large, very dilute plumes, but they're toxic at this dilution. So they impact large areas. They, they create a risk over huge areas. And so essentially, PFAS are everywhere. This is a map from Le Mans use newspaper. It's the forever pollution map, just looking at known PFAS sites and presumptive PFAS contaminant sites. There's a similar sort of map for the US that you can see in environmental health news. They use a different approach, but in the US, they're looking at potentially 57,000 sites for PFAS. So we're facing a contaminant that is everywhere. We're facing dealing with the number of contaminated sites that we've, we've already dealt with as an industry before now. So, so how can we treat it? Well, as remediation professionals, we all want to remove contamination and destroy it, right? That's our knee-jerk reaction. So if we look at the different ways that we can do that, this is a graph showing treatment efficiency. So the higher you are on the y-axis, the more efficient you are against contaminant concentration. Well, if we are looking at PFAS, we don't really think it can biologically degrade at the moment. There's not much evidence of chemical degradation of the, the contaminant. So we're left with physical removal. So physical removal is great for high concentrations. Say if you've got a gasoline plume, you're, you're pumping out the, the high concentrations of uh, free phase contamination, high concentrations of dissolved phase contamination. But if you're trying to get low concentration at low targets, you might need to move on to chemical and biological treatment to get you there. And with PFAS, that's not possible. And the concentrations that PFAS exists in is nanograms per liter. For, for your gasoline site, you might be looking at milligrams per liter. There might be nanograms or picograms per liter as the, as the target for PFAS. So what that means is you're pumping a lot of water with not a lot of contamination in there. So you're pumping huge volumes, you're running it through granular activated carbon. Granular activated carbon is not very efficient when you're pumping quickly in an exit situ situation. You need to have very clean GAC, so you're, you're swapping that out a lot. There's a lot of energy, a lot of equipment being used, a lot of cost. And of course, it's a high ongoing carbon footprint. So are we really going to do that for all these sites when potentially we are going to exacerbate another global problem, which is carbon dioxide production and, and the warming of the globe? So, so, so how do we deal with this one global problem without exacerbating another? And the way to do it then is adopt a sustainable remediation approach. So do the life cycle analysis, do the sustainability analysis of what you're planning and doing on your site, then effectively takes into account the effect on the rest of the planet, the effect on the rest of the site. So, so you're not then looking at your site in isolation. So what is sustainable remediation? So the ISO 18504 definition is the control of risks whilst optimizing environmental, social, and economic value of the work. So there is an option I'm going to talk about today, which is enhanced attenuation that can provide treatment of these very low concentrations and also can get rid of these ongoing costs and production of carbon dioxide, etc. So 
enhanced attenuation of PFAS. Does that make sense? Because PFAS doesn't biodegrade, right? So natural attenuation doesn't just mean biological degradation. It's also diffusion, it's dispersion, platelization, sorption, and abiotic degradation. So what we're wanting to do is take a natural attenuation process and enhance that, accelerate the effect of that. So what I'm going to be talking about today is increasing the ability of the aquifer to sorb the PFAS, what we call retention, and that will then enhance the attenuation of the PFAS plume. There's a really good paper on this by Chuck Newell called Enhanced Attenuation to Manage PFAS Plumes in Groundwater. In this, he looks at seven different techniques for enhancing attenuation of PFAS plumes, one of which is injection of particulate sorbents that I'm going to be talking about today. So you're essentially injecting a sorbent into the subsurface and you're slowing the movement of that contamination, the PFAS, through the groundwater dramatically. And what that does is it reduces the peak of the contamination discharging into a receptor. So in an uncontrolled situation, you've got the PFAS building up in the groundwater and, and hitting, say, a drinking well or a off-site surface water, something like that. And the flux is such that the concentration is above target levels. The idea behind enhanced attenuation is that you retain it in the subsurface, you slow the flux, you slow the movement of the contamination so that it doesn't get above uh, actionable levels and it keeps it essentially safe. So if we consider the PFAS source plume treatment, here we are on an airport, we've got a fire training area where they've been spraying the AFFF onto the area, it gets into the ground, it hangs up in those soils, over time, it's infiltrating because of precipitation down through the vado zone, touches the capillary fringe, touches the groundwater and starts to discharge very small amounts, but you only need small amounts to create these large plumes going off site. So what we're gonna do is talk about using something called colloidal activated carbon. So you probably know granular activated carbon from uh, groundwater treatment. So that's got a diameter of about a, a thousand micron. You might have used powdered activated carbon for dealing with vapors. That might have a diameter of anything from 50, say 250 uh, micron. We've milled the activated carbon down to a diameter of about one to two micron. So that's the size of a bacterium. That's the size of a red blood cell. Then what we've done is suspended it in water using dispersion agents to create a liquid. It's very like an ink-like liquid and it's a colloidal liquid. So it's a suspension of particles. And um, the product names are Plume Stop, Saw Stop. We also have one for, for Petrofix that we use for other purposes. And what you can do with this product is apply it into the source area and apply it as a barrier as well to deal with the source and the plume. And more specifically, you can go into the Vado zone and what you're doing is you're looking at reducing the leachability of that contamination um, that is stuck to the soils so that it's not moving, it's not discharging into the groundwater. You can then go down to the capillary fringe. Now, obviously, the, the, the PFAS is surface activated, so it likes to hang around at the air-water interface. So if you inject along the capillary fringe, you can prevent further discharge into the groundwater. You can inject the higher concentrations in the source area, so treating the groundwater at that location. And at that point, you are then hugely reducing the amount of contamination getting into the groundwater, and that allows the down gradient plume to attenuate. If you then have an offsite liability or, or a receptor just immediately offsite, then you can put in a plume stop barrier at that location as well and basically shut the gate, prevent any further contamination going off site and allow that attenuation to occur uh, under the site itself. So we've done this on 41 sites, I believe so far, it might be 42, 43 sites, but it's around, it's around about there right now in the US, Canada, UK, Norway, Sweden, Middle East and Australia. We have a number of case studies, there's a number of third party papers on there, and we can provide all of these. Our website's a good place to go to to look at that. I'm mentioning that because I'm not focusing on performance today. We're looking at sustainability. But just to touch on performance, there's a paper by Grant Carey and the University of Waterloo 
on the longevity of treatment using colloidal activated carbon. They looked at 17 sites with data over 0.3 to 6 years, and they found that out of 16 sites that have data, uh, one was seen to be an inappropriate technology. Essentially, it was used in a landfill or too close to a landfill, and what there was was uh, huge amounts of organic material coming off that. So it was essentially swamping the potential barrier. So it wasn't the technology for that location. Other sites were getting between 82 and 99% reduction, essentially getting down to, to non-detect of the PFAS moving beyond the barrier itself. So it's a really interesting read. If we dial in a bit closer to the site where I'm talking about today, there's a PFAS contaminated site. It's an international airport in the UK. They wanted to reduce their offsite liability. We've done a pilot study on that site and you can see that we got down to very low concentrations that we then maintained for nine months, which was the length of the pilot study. And we then took that on to a full-scale treatment, which was injected and we finished in February of this year. And we've been getting good results since then. So there's case studies on that that we can provide. We've got other things. If you want to email me on that for more information, that's absolutely fine to do that. And I can provide what we have. Okay. So we know it works, but how sustainable is it? So in theory, it should be sustainable, right? This is what we're telling ourselves. It's in situ, so it must be good. We've got low disruption. We come to site for a very short amount of time. We just do the injection work. We're only using a little rig. We're not leaving any pumping equipment on site. We're not having to keep going back to site. It's, it's really low maintenance, passive approach. So it must be sustainable, right? But, you know, we have to get quantitative about this in the world that we're in now and, and developing, you know, we have to look at the carbon footprint of what we're doing and prove what we're saying. So what we decided to do was have a third party study. So we approached Rambol to do a study for us on this particular site. So, so we worked with the head of circular solutions and climate specialist team in Finland. This is the site on the right. I've blurred it out because I believe that firefighters for airports can recognize each other's airports based on the shape of the pretend plane that they put out. So we, we have to kind of blur it out so you can't tell which airport it is. But essentially, this is a plan view. The, the green area on the left and to the top is basically the grass of the airport itself. The groundwater is coming from top left to bottom right. As it passes under the, the fire training area, which is in the gray, all the drains there are leaking, the interceptor is leaking. So the foam has gone down into there and it's getting then into the groundwater. The groundwater picks that contamination up and then moves over the site boundary. And you can see the darker green to the bottom right there, that's called defensive planting. Basically, it's a lot of bushes going up the hill, et cetera, to, to prevent entry into the airport. That's a steep slope and we've got a spring line in that slope. So the groundwater is moving quite quickly through a gravel. It then comes out, picks up the PFAS, comes out at the spring line, and we've got PFAS in surface water heading down into a stream. So what we wanted to do was compare the life cycle analysis for the in-situ sorption and retention barrier that we have installed on the site, and then compare it to the equivalent pump and treat system that could have been put in place. And it was considered putting a pump and treat system in place on this site. So. We did a life cycle inventory analysis on the barrier itself. So on the right there, you can see we injected a barrier in a line. And over seven weeks, I think, we injected a plume stop into the ground over 120 yards, 102 injection points. So we had an injection rig, a direct push rig, just moving along the site, injecting the product into the ground. And we would then go along and just check that we were getting overlapping radius of influence so that we didn't have any holes in the barrier and, and we were then treating the contamination and allowing that groundwater to flow through. Once that's in place, essentially you're off site and then there is just uh, validation monitoring to be completed twice a year for however long we, we need to keep going. So we designed it for a minimum of 15 years. It's very likely to last much longer and the source is going to be dealt with as well. So that will help too. So there's the uh, cross-section version of that barrier as well. So looking at the life cycle analysis of that then, we used the Gabby 10 professional software 
to do the life cycle analysis using data from Sphera and EcoInvent and to the ISO standards above there. So the boundaries that we picked were cradle to grave. Now, often for a product, you'll pick cradle to gate. So that is the upstream product, the manufacturing process, and then basically on the shelf ready to buy. It's at the gate of the factory ready to buy. What we want to do is the grave as well, because it's brought to site. There are activities involved with putting it in the ground. So the truer study is cradle to grave. So what we looked at here is the raw materials, the activated carbon that we get from the supplier, bring that to our manufacturing facility. We mill that down to the right size. We suspend that in water as a liquid. And then at this point for, for the US, it would then go to site. But in the middle there, you can see we're transporting it by ship across to the UK. It goes into our stores. And then when we're ready to do this site, it was delivered to site. And then it's injected into the ground using a direct push rig. At that point, there's no operation and maintenance, and there is just monitoring. And the end of life there is waste, and there is no waste material. There's nothing coming to the surface. Essentially, the waste are the pallets and the, the drums from the product itself, but, but nothing in terms of the, the PFAS coming to the surface. Itself. So we then designed an alternative pump and treat system. So this was based on three pump and treat designers put this together, or it was a consensus between three different pump and treat designs. The idea is that we're putting in extraction wells and it's operating over 15 years of the study with a 95% uptime. You'll notice there's a lot of wells there. And the idea is because it's fairly fast groundwater and we want to reduce the amount of drawdown. We don't want to create any vertical smear. So, so we've got a higher number of closer wells. And basically we're pumping out from that, it's running through a granular activated carbon system, and we've got operation and maintenance going on for the 15 years, as well as the same amount of validation monitoring. So there's the cross section there as well. So then if we look at the pump and treat system, uh, similarly cradle to grave, so we've got the raw materials going into making the equipment. We didn't assume that they were all used up in terms of the containers and things. They could have a life beyond the end of the project, etc. So they are manufactured into the pumps, the pipes, the tanks, brought to site. They're installed along with the extraction wells, transfer lines, etc. So you install the system, get the system going, and then once it's going, you've got 15 years of the operation and maintenance, uh, which involves electricity to keep the system running, and that's running off fuel. You've then got operation and maintenance in terms of the, the pumps will wear out, so they'll need to be replaced. So you have somebody coming to site and doing a number of site visits. So whereas normal monitoring would be 90 visits over the 15 years, here we're looking at something like 600 visits because you're going back and making sure the system is running. And then you've got waste management as well. It's going through granular activated carbon. The granular activated carbon becomes spent and you have to then get rid of that. And you've got wastewater as well. So that granular activated carbon is assumed to be going to landfill in this scenario. And there's the equivalent of the plimstop that I mentioned before. So looking at the carbon footprint first, the results are that the in situ retention using plume stop is using more than 98% less carbon. So we're looking at nearly 4,000 tons of CO2 equivalent for the pump and treat system, and it's about 56 tons equivalent over the 15 years for the plume stop barrier itself. So that's about 70% smaller carbon footprint. Now we've broken that down so we can see where the different impacts are. You can see at the bottom there, the total carbon footprint, 56 versus 3,922. And there's different areas there where the pump and treat system is using more electricity, it's producing waste, et cetera. But one of the key things is the granular activated carbon is the most significant impact there. So this is assuming it's going to landfill. I mean, we're already seeing that landfills are starting to not accept this. And that is because the contamination may last longer than the landfill itself. So you're just gonna create another source of contamination in the subsurface. So you're probably looking at incineration in the future. So this might make this line in the life cycle analysis worse. So what is the option to reduce or remove the granular activated carbon? So 
we looked at this as well. We thought about taking away the granular activated carbon main filters and using foam fractionation. So for those of you who haven't used foam fractionation or haven't come across it, but basically you are bubbling through the contaminated water and because PFAS is surface activated, it, it essentially sticks to the edges of the bubbles. You bring that out and you can skim that off. And we've left in a little bit of granular activated carbon at the end as a polishing phase, but you're reducing hugely the amount of granular activated carbon, but you are increasing the electricity use. So if we look at that, instead of being 98.5% lower, we're now 97.5 lower. So instead of being 70% smaller carbon footprint, the plume stop barrier is now 40. So it's making a difference, but you're not in the same ballpark. You know, you're still two orders of magnitude higher by doing an extractive treatment. So essentially changing the treatment is not having a significant reduction in that carbon footprint. So if you look into the figures, the pumping alone, so the pumping the water out is one to two orders of magnitude higher than the passive in situ system alone. So once you pumped it out, if you then treat, you're only really adding carbon footprint to this. So looking at the life cycle cost analysis, again, done by Ramble over a 15 year period, there are costs at different times throughout. So in terms of an in-situ barrier, there's a lot more upfront costs because you are coming in doing it all in one go. A pump and treat system, there is upfront costs installing it, but then there are operational costs over time. So what you have to do is roll that back to net present value. So essentially what are those future costs as if you paid for them all now? And that allows you to compare different approaches that happen with costs at different times, okay? So basically the plume stop barrier was 1.6 million compared to pumpetry with granular activated carbon of 4 million versus 4.6 million. So the in situ approach is 61 to 65% less in terms of life cycle cost analysis. If we then look at other factors, so we're looking at sustainable assessment scoring, what Ramble have is something called their SURE model. It's a tier two sustainable assessment. You can see that my animation's got ahead of me a little bit, so you've seen the results. But uh, what it is basically, it's, it's based on the standards of ISO and ASTM and also SURF UK guidance. And it's a linear additive multi criteria analysis method designed to incorporate both qualitative and quantitative information. So, what does that mean? It basically means that you get some experts together, they think of sustainability indicators for each of the domains, environment, society, and economy. Some of these can be qualitative, some of them can be semi-quantitative. And what you try and do is create a quantitative score. So for each of those domains, you've got five indicators. You then give them weighting as to how important they are. And then you score the plume stop versus the granular activated carbon versus the form fractionation and come out with a quantitative sustainability assessment. 100 is the ideal, and what we're seeing is the in-situ barrier has a score of 84 versus 43 for the others, and is generally better in all three of the domains. So in conclusion, remediation of PFAS site should consider sustainability for every site. There's just so many of these sites that you have to consider the bigger picture than just the site you're looking at. You know, we're on a site in Scandinavia in the middle of nowhere, should we really throw huge amounts of energy at this, given that we shouldn't be producing, we shouldn't be adding more carbon dioxide at a time where, as a species, we're supposed to be trying to reduce that impact. So by doing sustainability studies on what remediation approach you need to use, you can then ensure that your site is not being managed in isolation. Pump tree is a much higher carbon footprint for both of the components, pump and treat. So pumping alone is a much higher impact than in situ passive treatment. So any ex situ treatment on top of that will increase the impact. So enhanced attenuation of PFAS through retention using colloidal activated carbon is an effective and sustainable approach to address a global pollution issue. And that's me. Thank you for your time. If there's any questions, uh, that would be great. All right, thank you very much, Gareth. So that concludes the formal section of our presentation. So now at this point, we'd like to shift into the question and answer portion of the webcast. Before we do this, just a couple quick reminders. First, you will receive a follow-up email with a brief survey. We really appreciate your feedback. So please take a minute to let us know how we did. 
Also, right after the webinar, you'll receive a link to the recording as soon as it is available. All right, so let's circle back to the questions here. First question is for Avram. Avram, the question is, you mentioned a number of sites with groundwater reuse in your presentation. Is Integral working on any of these types of projects currently? Yeah, thanks. Yes, we are, actually. There's a couple. Um, but one I would point out uh, is for an industrial client in the Northeast who we have done quite a bit of work for over the years. They have an industrial chemical production facility that has a large PFAS plume and also uh, intermingled uh, VOC plumes, I might add. So actually quite a number of years ago, we, in addition to looking at all kinds of things, it became clear this is a really quite a significant plume and um, that some kind of integrated plume capture strategy made sense. Incorporating production wells, adding some extraction wells, and probably having a reinjection component, both to return water to the, the aquifer. Uh, this is an area where everybody's on groundwater for drinking water supply. Reinjection, both to deal with the water rights issues, but also to creatively incorporate reinjection as a containment strategy as well. So We've done a whole bunch of modeling in support of that and expanding that modeling, fade transfer modeling and hydraulic modeling now and um, doing pre-design work uh, for that. So that will have reinjection, but we'll also incorporate, if things go as planned, production wells that are used for drinking water supply. All right, thank you, Avram. So the next question here is for Gareth. Uh, Gareth, the question is, did you use the life cycle analysis from a granular activated carbon to work out the impact of the plume stop barrier greenhouse gases? Well, yes, we included that in the process. So, as I said, we were using uh, uh, EcoInvent and Sphera for, for most of our data for the life cycle analysis of the colloidal activated carbon products. What we did is we used the life cycle analysis of a granular activated carbon and then we took into account the transport to our factory as well the extra milling that we do the suspension in water as well so we aren't just using that we are trying to get this as uh, accurate as possible and where the data wasn't available uh, in databases for for additives and things like that then we, we're looking at the scientific literature and environmental um, product declarations to make sure this is as close as we can uh, make it. Okay, thank you, Gareth. All right, so we have another question here. This one's for Avram. Avram, why do you think we do not see more coupled aquifer restoration and reuse projects? Yeah, it's a good question. And it's actually something that I, I think uh, at Interval we're gonna look into a little bit more. I, I just think it's the, the, the quick answer is, um, in some cases, as designers with our clients, we're not necessarily thinking. If I think it's a it's a perspective change that needs to happen. But then, as I mentioned in my talk, there are some administrative limitations as well. So there's just some practical limitations. It's just not going to be <clears throat> allowed in some cases. But then we have other cases that very much it is allowed. Um, and I just want to emphasize that a lot of these are are combined remedy situations too with source area treatment. Okay, thanks, Avram. Uh, so here's another question here. This one's for Gareth. Gareth, the question is, uh, is the PFAS just contained in the barrier without degrading? Uh, will it eventually break through? That's right. Essentially, this is retention. Uh, what we're doing is we are increasing the ability of the aquifer to retain the contamination in the aquifer itself so that it allows the down gradient plume to, to attenuate so that the concentrations never get above um, actionable levels. So, so you are having it enter the barrier. If, if you constantly have a, um, the same challenge concentration coming in, you are getting um, competitive absorption or, or rollover so the contamination will eventually break through. So it could be that in the future you would then need to reapply the barrier but you're talking about whether it's 20, 30 years down the line, then you're just having another six weeks on site where you, you re-inject at that point. However, that said, you know, really you should couple it with source treatment. And on the site that I just showed you, that that is the plan, basically just the, the way it's working. They needed to 
remove their offsite liability, but then they've got a plan to go in and fix all the drains, etc. So when they go in and do that, remove the interceptor, we'll go in and remove that source and uh, apply product in that source area. And what that'll do is reduce the challenge concentration coming into the barrier. So the barrier will, will continue to uh, be active for many, many, many more, more decades uh, to come. Okay, hey, thanks, Gareth. So here's another question for our, uh, Avram. And Avram, the question is, can you talk more about uh, combined remedies as the concept applies to groundwater reuse projects? Yeah, no, I think it's absolutely critical. I mean, when you get when you get to these large scale sites, and I think those of us that have worked on those could really can vouch for this. I mean, it really comes down to will an application of a given source zone or smaller scale remedy change the operational life cycle, about time of operation for let's say a groundwater containment system. And at a certain site scale under certain conditions, yes, obviously. I mean, it's something we've learned very intensely over the decades of, of the remediation industry is that we can change the operational life cycle with the uh, correct and efficient application of, of, of in situ remedies. But there's a scale out there that I can vouch for where in, in certain hydrogeologic conditions and also the situation where pumping is going to happen anyway for for water production where the, it doesn't move the, the, you know those kind of remedies don't move the needle and it's a those are that's a subset and it's a relatively rare subset but i think we're going to see so it's a matter of doing you know it's doing the kind of analyses the kind of stuff gareth is talking about and the kind of <clears throat> other kinds of life cycle evaluations to really make those decisions early thank you avram so uh, let's see here's another question this one's for gareth uh, gareth the question is the cost analysis was for 15 years. Is this the end of the treatment or how would the costs change after this? Yeah, uh, good question. I, 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 essentially, we had to pick a number um, to do the study over. So, so this was a very conservative low end of how long the barrier would last if you didn't do source treatment. And, and the plan is to do source treatment. Um, so we chose that as a point at which to compare it to pump and treat. So let's take that worst case scenario. Let's say that the airport decide not to, to do any source treatment. Let's say that we do start to have breakthrough at that 15 year point. You would then get the costs again, exactly the same cost as you saw before. So it was about a million dollars. In that time, you would have spent the four million on the pump and treat. Let's say the barrier then just lasts another 15 years, so you've spent two million. By the time you get to that point, the pump and treat system would have spent the eight, nine million. It's essentially linear, but the spending is slightly different in that there's a lump sum every 15 years at that point, whereas there's a, a linear cost for the active system itself. Working that out using net present value sort of bends the curve a little bit, but that's complicating it a little bit. But as I say, actually, if you treat the the source along with the barrier and reduce that that concentration coming in, then essentially this cost is all you need to do. And the intention would be that there'd be no further operational costs uh, or reapplication costs in the future. All right, thank you, Gareth. So that's going to be the end of our chat questions. If we did not get your question, someone will make an effort to follow up with you. If you would like to learn more about services from Integral, you can visit integral-corp.com. If you'd like to learn more about remediation solutions from Regenesis, please visit regenesis.com. Thanks again very much to Avram Frankel and Gareth Leonard, and thanks to everyone who could join us. Have a great day.